This is Covered Calls with Kevin Simpson, featuring expert insights and analysis from the industry's top investment professionals. If you'd like a deeper understanding of today's markets, this is the show for you. Thank you for tuning into today's episode of Covered Calls with Kevin Simpson. I thought it might be fun before we meet today's guest to run through a few statistics that I found fairly disturbing. One in six students today does not reach the baseline for financial literacy proficiency. Nearly 25% of millennials spend more than they earn. 67% of Gen Y have less than three months of emergency funds. And my guest today wants to solve these problems. Joining me is Nan Morrison. She's the president and CEO of the Council for Economic Education. In addition to her long and accomplished career, which we'll get into, and she's certainly the smartest person in this room, uh, Nan, you've also completed five triathlons. So very, very impressive across the board. Um, I, I, I'm going to begin with the statistics because I, as disturbing as they are, I'm surprised that they're not even worse. What are your thoughts on where we are today with financial literacy? Tell us about the organization, where we're going, and how can we help? Yeah, so so thanks so much, first of all, for having me on the show today. It's a real honor and privilege to spend any time with you, uh, as I've learned in the last several months since we've gotten to know each other. So I appreciate you sharing the statistics, but I also want to uh, share some, some better news about what financial education can do to help. So as you know, uh, the mission of the Council for Economic Education, or CEE, as we like to say, is to provide the tools and knowledge of personal finance and economics to K through 12 kids so they can make better decisions for themselves, their families, and their communities. We carry out our mission by providing professional development for teachers and resources for them to use in the classroom, all professionally developed, having great programs for kids, for the students directly, and also uh, for some family programs. One of the other things that we do is advocate for more and better financial education. So coming up in just a few weeks, we'll be launching our 2022 Survey of the States, which is a survey that looks at every state in the country to understand where they are in terms of how they provide financial and economic education to their students. And what we see is that less than half the states actually require a class to be even offered for either of those subjects, which is really sad. But there's some some good news uh, here. There's been a lot of research in the past few years that shows that financial education does actually make a difference. So in our 2020 survey of the states, we included some of that. Uh, So we know that, for example, uh, if students have a financial education course in high school, they are over time more likely to have lower default rates on their student loans, higher credit scores, they will get better financing for college, and for those low and moderate income students, they are likely to get uh, more scholarship money and fewer loans. So all of this just from having financial education in high school. And think about the long-term impact of that. If any of you have ever repaid student loans, you know that even if you're a fortunate person with a great job after college or graduate school, it takes a really long time and it prevents you from doing other things. Credit scores are super important every time you go to do anything. People want to know, buy an apartment, buy a car. So, so I think there's, there's some hope there. We'd like to see some more states providing more access to students uh, so that they can have better and more financial education. And we'll be working on that over the next several years in partnership with a number of other not-for-profits and some private sector companies, which we're very excited about. I'm just gonna add one more note, which is that access really matters. So one of the things that C is doing is really working hard to provide more access in many ways. Now, if a state passes a requirement, that's great, but there's still a gap with all of those states that don't have requirements between kids from better school districts and kids from from not so great school districts or kids from low and moderate income families, which because we pay for school through real estate taxes, that's just the way it kind of works out. So we've become very focused on on that access problem uh, because when when you provide access to people, they have a chance to build wealth, they have a chance to improve their lot in life, 
I recently talked to a supporter who told me he has finally convinced a friend of his to start having a brokerage account and buying stocks and investing. This gentleman is in his 50s. Think about that long tail of the last 25 years of his working life, where even just having a simple ETF would have made with 10% of his income might have had, uh, think of the impact that that might have had on his life and his savings and his ability to do for his children or even his grandchildren. So, so the access issue is a big one for us because every time we can get one person, just one person to have, make some better decisions, to be able to understand savings and investing, they are better off, their children are better off and their, their families and communities are better off. It also then prepares them to be in a position to do more and better things with their lives and to continue to build that wealth and create that economic opportunity. So for example, they will have the foundation knowledge, the basic language and, and grammar to read Walk Towards Wealth, right? That's that's a an incredibly well-written, thoughtful book. I, I'm so pleased <laughs> to be able to say that having been through it this weekend, but you have to know a few words before you get there. And we wanna make sure that every child in this country has that vocabulary so that when they see a book like this, they can say, oh, that would be helpful to me. Oh, if I'm lucky enough to have enough assets to really work with a financial planner and advisor, I know how to select one, which is also covered in the book. So we have to provide that baseline in the K through 12 space so that they are ready to rock and roll when they go out into the real world. Well, you know how important this cause is to me and my upbringing had no exposure to financial literacy and certainly our school district had no mandates or interests in even um, it, to talking about the topic. And I remember being a senior in high school in 1987, which is what brought me the, in, it really into this business and, and having no answers. And, and really none of the professors or teachers, I guess not professors, were, were able to, to answer any of the questions that I had. And I had to go out and dig this up on my own before there was an internet. So the idea of being able to expose people, students to financial literacy is so important because the earlier we get exposed to it, the more natural a part of our life it becomes. And listening to your story about the gentleman who was in his 50s and had been afraid to invest, think about the power of starting early and the importance of starting early. And it's just it's a it's a great um, it, it's a great tribute to him that he's getting involved now, but we've got to pass that on to his children and his grandchildren to be able to make sure that people understand what investing is, the power of compounding and the power of time. How many states do have this as a part of a curriculum at this point? Is that something that is, is the majority of states offering financial education? Where are we today? So as of 2020, 21 states require high school students to take a course in personal finance. That was up for then. I, I can't tell you what's happening on the current survey of the states because we have a big release coming up in three weeks. 25 students require a high school student to take a class in, in economics. So, you know, we're, we're, we're at or barely at half of the, the states. Um, the state of economics is actually getting a little bit worse. Fewer states are requiring testing, which I know is a controversial subject, but at the end of the day, if it's important enough, people tend to test for it. And in fact, the National Assessment Governing Board dropped their economics assessment uh, in their last cycle, which is too bad. Um, on the plus side, we've partnered with Jumpstart and a group of experts in our field to put together a unified, updated set of national personal finance standards. And we are hoping that with those standards, we will be able to provide a toolkit and a starting line for not just teachers, but also districts and states to really have more robust requirements and financial education in their states. Uh, we've, we've updated them. We've included behavioral economics concepts. We've in included uh, a lot of the technology now that's available to people. Kevin, I just wanted to go back to something you said about uh, not, not having financial education and having any introduction to this growing up. For me, I was so incredibly lucky growing up. My parents were both uh, children of the depression and they never failed to tell me a story <laughs> about that uh, when I wanted something, but they also paid cash for things. 
And when they were making a big purchase, I got lugged to the car place or the appliance place, and they actually counted out the cash uh, in dollars. Things were less expensive then to show me that you save up and buy things. I was really young, but those were really powerful lessons. And even though I use credit cards for convenience all the time now, I pay my bill every month because that was something that I was taught when I was really young. I also was very fortunate that uh, my dad and my uncles owned the local radio station. So I remember going there with my dad and I had a job while he was busy doing whatever he needed to do. It was to count the money that came out of the soda machine, to count all the coins and to roll the coins. Uh, and my reward for my hard labor was an orange crush, which my mother never had at home. And then we would go to the bank and we would deposit those. And at some point I decided that instead of an orange crush, I'd rather get paid real money. And I put that into a bank account. And today people are less likely, especially younger children are less likely to have a physical bank account, but parents can replicate some of that process using some of the, the many apps that are available today and still have the discussion. Um, importantly, my father also encouraged me not to be afraid of money matters at all. Uh, and I also remember sitting there on my pink rug. So you know how small I was because it still had that nice little girl pink rug. And he put in front of me the newspaper, uh, the Wall Street Journal. It had one of those pencil drawings of Mickey Seabird on it. And it was yep. when he first uh, got her seat on the exchange. And he explained all of this to me. Now, I don't think that I really understood anything that he was talking about, like a chair. Did she have a physical chair? Didn't get that. But this is decades later. And I still remember that moment of him showing me that a woman can do anything, that a woman can be smart about money and finance and even, even have a great job in that, in that industry. And as you know, I was a management consultant, so it was sort of a financial career before I took this role. And I'm so pleased that we have a wonderful program at CEE called Invest in Girls, which focuses not only on helping them to understand personal finance, but also introduces them to the possibility of the range of careers that they can have in, in finance. So um, I'm hoping that that little bit of my dad lives, lives along through this, this program. But uh, for me, I, I was really lucky. I just heard this all the time. So when I found out about CEE, when they called me about the job, it was just astonishing to me that people didn't grow up with this. And then I thought, well, of course, if they're not going to grow up with it, and there are lots of good reasons, cultural reasons, people don't like to talk about money. People don't under the bank, understand the banking system because English isn't their first language, but then we really have to teach it in school because this really is the key to having, um, to be able to have the things that you want in life uh, and make the life that you would like for yourself, whatever that happens to be. Much like you, I was raised in a family that was very open about money or, or the lack thereof having it and the power of it. My grandmother was very influential in teaching about the, the power of savings. So although I never had exposure to the stock market, and quite frankly, we probably couldn't have afforded a Wall Street Journal, but the ability to use a passbook savings was one of my first introductions. So for those of us old enough to remember that, it was a really fun way to, to watch compounding interest because you'd get to put an entry in when there was actually money deposited into the account. Of course, there was interest back then and we're not quite at a point now where it's all that exciting. But I, I, I was very fortunate to, to, to understand what the difference is between being able to buy something and being able to afford something. And when you talk about credit, I mean, that's just something so important because it's like this idea that, that we can go to the mall and we can buy anything we want but it doesn't mean that we can afford anything we want. And there's a, a huge difference there. So, so even just being exposed to those types of things with but which we both were at home gave us an advantage and a leg up. Our, our viewers are primarily financial advisors now, and we have all, all wonderful um, financial advisors that have great clients who have children and grandchildren. And for those more than half of the states that are not putting financial literacy into K through 12, are there resources on the CEE website where we could uh, send our financial advisors to maybe look at just to, to get some of this exposure when it's not offered in schools? Thanks so much, Kevin. We sure do. We started a virtual transformation three or four years ago because teachers were driving that for us and they needed more resources online. So as we went through our strategy, 
we said, gosh, we're doing family financial fun nights with all these fun exercises in person with parents at schools. What if we could make those resources more broadly available as part of our digital transformation? So we recently added family financial fun packs, and those are online. You can find them on the councilforeconed.org website. They are grade banded, K2, 2, 4, 4, 6, 6, 8, and 9, 12. And they have lots of really good, fun activities, a lot of them math-based, one of my favorite things, uh, for people to use with their families. And if you're a financial advisor, they're perfect. You can download them. You don't have to worry about doing a session for your clients' kids. They're there. Use them. The other thing is, if you're volunteering in your local community, we also designed these so that they did not require big investments. You didn't have to go to the store and buy a lot of expensive things to do the exercises. You can do them with with paper, with with pens, pencils, some scissors, and maybe a little tape and some coins. So we tried to keep it really simple. So if you're doing some volunteer work and want to sit down with a group of kids, maybe you're volunteering at your local community center, or there's a school where you're already tutoring, it's really very easy to incorporate these kinds of activities into whatever you're doing with them. And it's very accessible to the the students. I think a lot of financial advisors could even do this in their branch office, maybe have a, a, you know, a Saturday finance open house or, or, you know, the family game nights once a week after, uh, after work, but just any type of exposure and even getting kids into a financial advisor's office is really cool. I remember the first time I walked in as an intern, it it was probably Merrill Lynch and, um, I was just blown away by all, all of the, uh, the the things that I was seeing for the first time when I had my first job at, and that was at WH Newbold Son and Company in Philadelphia. The ticker tape was the coolest thing uh, for me to, to to be able to see it in real life and everything else. So and, and again, it just gets back to exposure. How can we expose people to to something so so important and something that isn't uh, put on as a top priority? And of course, you would love mathematics. Why not a shameless plug for the fact that you um, had a bachelor's degree of applied mathematics at, uh, from Yale before uh, getting your MBA in Harvard? So smart, <laughs> smart uh, cookie. Thank you. Well, I, I I think doing those those family nights, whether it's for their advi- their clients and their their children, or for for others in their community, is great. These events are are so much fun. Uh, and the kids love them. And I think it's really eye-opening for the, the parents because a lot of parents, uh, even if they're fortunate enough to have thoughtful financial advisors in their lives, don't really know how to talk to their kids about money. And they're afraid to, or they don't know how, and they're worried that their children might get worried about it. But most of the kids, they're, they're actually really interested. The little kids, as you know, are just learning machines. And the older kids are trying to start doing stuff without their parents, and they want to know how to do that. <laughs> So, so it works out really well. We've also found that pizza is a really great way to encourage people to show up at just about anything. So yeah, you can get me to do just about anything if you have a good pizza. Exactly. And being, being, being a New Yorker, we've got plenty of great pizza here, but we've done that in other places. Well, I mean, I can't let you get off the hook without telling me your top pizza place in New York. If you, if you have a favorite. So I, I actually do have a favorite that is, um, a new place that's in my neighborhood and it's just a little place it's not one of the famous brooklyn places but it's called cafe centro and they make calzones and i really love calzones uh and so that is that is my favorite but of course the best pizza is in new haven <laughs> so. we made a trip there last summer and it's hard to argue Although Staten Island give can give uh, New Haven a run for their money. That's that is that is true. I don't get out there too too frequently. Well, I think um, I think this is just such an important topic, and maybe this is a good time to mention the fact for those of you who are, are unaware, and certainly you're not watching this podcast and not not um, having heard at least that we have a new book out, or I wrote a book called Walk Towards Wealth, and all all of the proceeds, all of the profits are going to the Council for Economic Education. So. Please uh, go to barnesandnoble.com, amazon.com, your local bookstores, you know, buy many, many copies because uh, it's, it's supporting a wonderful cause as you're learning today. And anything that we can do to promote financial literacy for students is, is a cause so, so important. And 
on the bottom of the screen throughout the presentation, you've been seeing uh, links to the Council for Economic Education. And I would encourage you to definitely check out some of the games and some of the educational pieces. It's, uh, it's well, well worth your time. And, and Nan, if there's anything else that you think is important to talk about with respect to the organization, wh what else do we need to know? Well, there, there are a couple of things. First, uh, we have a great two great challenges, the National Personal Finance Challenge and the National Economics Challenge. And the Personal Finance Challenge in particular uh, is, is such an easy way for kids to get engaged with thinking about money and, and, and finance and how to manage money. So if any of you out there are interested in fielding some teams, we have a new coaching guide and you can look online and there's information there. Um, and you know, please feel free to put Put together teams of uh, high school students in in your in your life or in your neighborhood or among your your clients to participate. We we want to grow the challenge. We have about twenty thousand uh, kids that participate each year, and it's just a, a great great opportunity. And the the local challenges always need judges to 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 help in the case study round competition. If you really fall in love with CEE, please support our our. Uh, gala this year. It's April 6th. We have three amazing honorees, all women, Claudia Golden, Barbara Novick, and uh, Thesunda uh, Brown Duckett. Uh, they will be in a fireside chat with Steve Leisman, CNBC senior economics reporter. That's on April 6th. There's more information on that on our website. If you're not in New York City, where we're actually going to be live, it's so exciting. Uh, you can also stream virtually, and uh, the fireside chat is always a really, uh, really wonderful part of the the event and i think it's going to be tremendous uh this year as well so uh more opportunities to get engaged on the ground in your communities and to think about having some fun with us uh and supporting our cause with our visionary awards gala coming up uh in just a little over a month maybe steve leishman will even play guitar at your event in april you know, I have heard him play guitar. I have gone to very late at night concerts to hear him play guitar. He is really, really good, as you probably know. And at some point, I am going to convince him to play at our our event and get the whole band there because I I love his his music. They're they're an incredible group. They really are. They're a you know, as you know, a Grateful Dead cover band. Yeah. But they just have um, they really rock. He's quite talented. Well, make sure that our viewers are aware of that as well. We'll try to bump up your bump up your audience. Uh, I, I I can't thank you enough for coming on, Nan. You know, I think you're the greatest. I think the organization is so so important. And now we're getting to to share this information and spread the word, and that's that's what this is all about. So thank you so much for coming on. We look forward to having you back again. Look forward to participating in all of these events, and I'll make sure that as as you continue to, to put on these great programs that we get that information out on our mailing lists and our, and our viewers are able to, um, to participate as well. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you so much. It's, uh, as I said, an honor and privilege to be here and we wouldn't be around without people like you. So <laughs> it's been great. Thanks. Thanks, Nat. This message does not constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to purchase securities through CWP Advisory Services. Investments are not guaranteed and involves risk of loss. The views and opinions expressed in this message are those of investment professionals made at the time this content was recorded, are not necessarily the views and opinions of CWP, and may change in time without notification. For additional information about CWP, visit CWP's or the SEC's website for a copy of our ADV Disclosure Brochure and Form CRS.